Thanks a lot. Don't you think like music makes this conference much more easy and attractive and light? Do you like it? Yeah, give them a good applause. You're great. Thank you. So before we come to the next talk, one thing, we found a hotel card from Arc Hotel. If anybody misses one, it's with me and later it's gonna be at uh, front of house. And um, we have one question left that I was lucky to get answered for you from uh, Stefan's talk. Yes, let me read it out. Which short-term developments in smart contracts do you think will have the biggest likelihood to drive this long-term change? So this was the uh, economy talk this morning and he instantly said, well, it's avoiding black markets or a shadow economy. So I hope this fulfills your question. And without further um, ado, we will go to Martin, our next talk on this stage. Exactly. Martin is a core team member. Uh, he is responsible for many clever ideas and concepts in the NEOS core. Um, he is a repeated release manager, latest for the version 8, the most recent version. And he told me something interesting. He is the first one to uh, commit an emoji into the NEOS core. So anybody who finds it uh, will get a beer with Martin tonight. <laughs> Have fun with his Anyone? talk, responsive images. Martin. Hello, happy to be together with you all again in one place. Today I will talk about responsive images. I will start with a short recap why this topic is relevant. Then we will take a look at the HTML standard and how it evolved over time until today. And after that, we will look at the CMS specific challenges and how we are trying to overcome them with our package, Sidegeist Kaleidoscope. I expect to have some time for questions at the end. Be warned, there will be code, but I hope the ideas will be accessible to anybody. Why is the topic relevant? I brought, I brought the four reasons that are most important to me, of which the first one is devices. The devices the internet evolved on were fairly uniform, and back then we always had the assumption that in an ideal situation, a website should look the same everywhere. Well, that is not the case anymore. We nowadays expect the website to look good and to perform on devices that have a width of somewhere between 600 to 6,000 pixels. And may be used in portrait or landscape mode. The second reason is the available bandwidth. While network conditions generally have improved, there are still lots of areas with suboptimal bandwidth, especially outside of the cities. Rural areas may sound not that important for your target group, but keep in mind that rural areas also means your target group traveling or on vacation. So, in fact, most of your customers will experience bad network conditions from time to time, and most likely on mobile devices. 
The third reason is timing. Images are usually requested by the browser at the first possible time while the HTML is parsed. That means the browsers are loading CSS, JavaScript, and images simultaneously, which means that the browser has no other information at hand than the HTML to make decisions about which image should be loaded and when. Last reason is payload. Images make a huge part of that. Usually, the HTML of a website is about 10 to 100 kilobyte. CSS is roughly the same. JavaScript, slightly more, depending on the framework, it may be up to half a megabyte. But images easily add up to one to two and a half megabyte. That means images make up to three-fourths of the bits we are sending to our customers. In total, of course, you can mess up performance in many ways, but you will not achieve great performance without caring for responsive images. Let's take a look at the standards for images in HTML. It is known that the whole internet was built for cat images. At least we think so. But that is actually not true. The proof for that is that images have not even been part of the first version of HTML back then in 1992. Images were added to HTML with version 2 in 1995 with the introduction of the IMG tag that initially only had the attributes source and alt that are still in use today. Later editions brought the title attributes and the width and the height attribute, which are used by the browsers to reserve screen space while images are being loaded. That finally made cats appear everywhere on the internet as we know it today. The evolution of the image standard then pretty much stopped in 1997, which is a bit surprising since at the same time, websites used more and bigger images and also the devices started to become more diverse. There always have been discussions about adding support for multi-resolution images to HTML, but for a long time, those were rejected with the main argument that this would only be needed as a temporary solution until there would be enough bandwidth for anybody to use a single high-resolution image. We are still waiting for that to happen. What happened was smartphones and tablets and an internet that became mobile. With the standards not suitable to the task, the internet did what it always does. It used JavaScript to work around browser shortcomings. There were many different approaches, but most of them fell into the category of replace the image source with a small placeholder and store the actual sources in some data attributes. Once the HTML is loaded, JavaScript is then used to replace the placeholder. While those solutions allow quite a bit of flexibility and are quite popular to this day, they have a common drawback, which is that they can only work once JavaScript is evaluated, which means they cause a delay for the most important images that are visible immediately to the user. To really solve this, the standards had to evolve eventually, which they did since HTML5. The first use case that was supported by HTML is support for multiple resolutions of the same cat image. This became necessary after displays gained higher resolutions than the 72 dots per inches that have been standard for decades. To achieve this, the source set attribute was added to the IMG tag, which contains a list of so-called 
candidate URLs that are combined with a descriptor marking the resolution of the image behind the URL. With those informations, plus the resolution of the current display, which the browser also knows, it can choose one of the image candidates and request that image instead of the source at parse time. Keep in mind, all images inside a source set are considered to be equal, resolution aside, and browsers are allowed to uh, take factors like the current bandwidth or things like a data saving mode on mobile devices into consideration while choosing an image. This looked simple and already allows us to specify multiple images in multiple resolutions, but the use for that is actually quite limited because it mainly covers cases where images are displayed in the same dimension across all devices, but in optimal resolution. Of course, that's not a proper way to appreciate cat images, but there are use cases for that. The most common one is company logos. In most cases, we instead want to take full advantage of each, of each device and display the cat image in a matching width with optimal resolution, which means with as many pixels as possible, but not more. Or we want to display images differently depending on the current size and orientation. Both cases cannot be solved by just looking at the screen resolution. We need a way to distinguish between images in multiple widths depending on the size they are displayed in. To achieve this, the sizes attribute was added to the IMG tag to give the browser a hint about the screen size the image will be given eventually. The sizes attribute combines media queries with size hints, and if the first media query did not match, the browser will look at the next until a matching size is found or the default at the end is reached. With the information, from the sizes plus the screen resolution, the browser will then look into the source set again and pick one of the images from there. To allow that, the descriptors for the candidate URLs have to contain the width of the image behind the URL when source set is combined with sizes. Again, the browser is allowed to take all information it has into account while choosing an image. So far, we always rendered the same image in different resolutions, but for an optimal user experience, it sometimes would be even better to show different images depending on the context. Important images like key visuals often require different crops of the same Im image depending on the current screen size or orientation. Of course, it is possible to crop images via CSS, but you should be aware that in that case, your user will load an image that might be twice as big as needed, and transferring a megabyte of data, while 500 kilobyte would be enough, makes a huge difference for users on mobile networks. In even more advanced cases, the user experience would be even better by showing totally different images depending on the different use cases. An obvious example for that would be to show a black cat in dark mode and otherwise a white one. A probably more realistic use case for that would be to allow a different image for square crop and another one for the landscape crop because it is not always possible to take those two crops in good quality from the same source. The technical solution for both cases is the picture tag that contains multiple source tags together with an image tag. Each single source combines 
a media query that defines in which cases this source is suitable with a source set and sizes and plus optional attributes of width and height. The browser will then choose the first source with a matching media query, other than with the source set before, the browsers are allowed no freedom here. They really have to pick the first source where the media query matches. And the properties of the selected source, again, source set sizes, width, and height, are applied to the image tag instead of the original ones. At last, the image tag is rendered as before by choosing one of the images from the source set. The picture tag has yet another use case. If we stick with cats, we know cats come in different forms. Some are skinny, some not, and some even take the shape of the environment they are in. But that is not the kind of format I am referring to. I am referring to the format of the image file itself, which for a long time has been always JPEG or PNG. In recent years, some new formats have emerged that are even more efficient. To support this, the picture tag allows to specify the type of each image source. Each browser has to pick a source with a type that it can handle. This allows to already use image formats that are not available in all browsers yet, while providing fallbacks for older browsers. Of course, the type attribute can be mixed with media, but uh, that creates a level of extra complexity, and I would personally try to avoid it. Until now, we talked about static images of cats. But we know the behavior is what really distinguishes cats from other animals. The most notable behavior of cats is related to food. Most cats really like food. One could say the default behavior of cats is eager loading. But some cats do not care at all unless it is the right food served by the right person at the proper time. Very similar things happen to cat images. For ages, all images were requested immediately while the HTML was parsed. To control this, the loading attribute was added to specify whether images are to be loaded eagerly, which means during parsing, or lazy, once they are coming close to the viewport. This allows to distinguish between images that are visible from the start, like key visuals, those should always be loaded eagerly, and images further down the line, which should be loaded lazy or may never be loaded at all. While the loading attribute has been a part of the HTML standard for some years, browser report really came slow. The browser that was lagging behind in this case was Safari, which forced us to use JavaScript-based surrogates for a long time. One could argue that Safari is actually not that important, but Safari also means mobile Safari, and that one is important. However, this has changed some weeks ago, and loading lazy is today natively supported in all relevant browsers. So it would be a good time to consider whether you still want to use JavaScript uh, solutions for that or you want to go with a native HTML. Another interesting aspect of cat behavior is interaction with the environment, especially when cats appear in places where there were no cats before. Things may get pushed around, and often some damage is done. Similar things happen to cat images. I'm referring here to what happens when a cat image eventually has been loaded and the browser will render it. If no place has been reserved for the image, the browser 
we very likely have to make room for the image by pushing some contents around. Since this can be very irritating to the user, search engines really dislike layout shifting and might consider your website less relevant. You will probably have heard about cumulative layout shifts, which is a value from the core web vitals. Those are often caused by suddenly appearing cat images. To circumvent this, the space for the image has to be reserved from the beginning, so the rendering of the image will only affect a small part of the screen. The easiest way to achieve this is by providing width and height attributes. Those values allow the browser to calculate the aspect ratio for this image, apply the CSS rules to that, and reserve the needed space. Of course, the same can be done by CSS, which allows to define the aspect ratio explicitly. That was the current status quo of cat images, but what can we expect in future? One thing that I'm pretty sure that it will happen eventually is that browsers will become smarter when picking images from source sets. First, and most importantly, by actually considering the network conditions or data saving modes. They even could consider the actual sizes of lazy loaded images because for those images, the CSS is evaluated before the image is loaded. There is, as far as I know, currently no browser that already does this, but I'm pretty sure it will happen eventually because the user experience would be much better if browsers would consider this. Another thing is that PNG and JPEG, which have been a standard for decades, and there was no question about which image format one would use, but um, this is coming to an end. There are newer formats like WebP and EVIF, which are more effective, and especially WebP is already supported in all major browsers. So while this may sound bold, one could, or I think one should think about um, using WebP as a default image format. And yeah, if not today, it will definitely not be in the far future. Looking at the standard, the topic is not exactly trivial, but also nothing one cannot understand with a little effort and some coffee. But responsive images turn out to be surprisingly hard to actually do right, especially in a CMS like Neos. The first problem is that the implementation is often not trivial. Editors may or may not be allowed to choose images of unexpected proportions. The same content can be used in multiple contexts like columns or containers which affect the image dimensions or the responsive behavior. And also the separation of presentation and integration which we consider important requires us to create the URLs on the integration side and the HTML markup on the presentation side. The result would be generating dozens of URLs and passing them from integration to presentation. That is error prone and cause, can cause lots of trouble when requirements evolve. Even worse than that is the fact that errors in the implementation of responsive images are notoriously hard to spot. First, when you are loading images with a higher than needed resolution, you simply cannot see it. Very likely, you will also not feel the loading time because you're sitting in an office with good connectivity. And on top of that, all browsers other than Firefox might trick you by showing a cached image from the same source set. So be aware of that when you are trying your uh, mobile viewports, you might be looking at uh, desktop images which are scaled down. 
When tasks are error prone, it usually is a good idea to consider automation. And for that, we created Zeitgeist Kaleidoscope. Before I continue, who of you has already heard about Kaleidoscope? Who tried it out? And who uses it all the time? Ah, about half. Oh, surprising, cool. <laughs> um, the idea behind Kaleidoscope is as follows. We wanted to automate the generation of multiple image URLs. We wanted to make the decisions about the rendered dimensions on the presentation side to avoid communication problems, because no communication causes no problems. Um, and we wanted to make spotting errors as easy as possible, ideally in the style guide. Aside of that, we wanted to stick as close to the HTML standard as possible. Regarding the image URLs, we decided not to pass dozens of URLs, but a single thing which we are calling an image source. An image source is an object that is created once on the integration site and is then passed over to the presentation where it is used to generate the images in the needed resolutions. The example shows an image source which is created for a standard image node. This image source is then passed to a Sidegeist Kaleidoscope image prototype, which in many aspects looks like an image tag, except that it gets a single image source instead of multiple URLs. This allows to specify the, width, uh, the source set without any URLs by only listing the width descriptors. The sizes attribute is exactly as in HTML and is simply passed down. The optional width and height properties are applied to the image source, which allows to enforce the dimensions of an image on the presentation side, which also means that the integration side does not have to care about image widths and only should care about supporting the editor to select an image with a suitable aspect ratio. Even if not specified, width and height will always be rendered to avoid the layout shifting during loading. Of course, loading behavior can be specified, specified as well. There is a default to lazy loading, which is in most cases correct. Of course, you should adjust that for important images like key visuals. In addition to that, you can also enforce the format of the rendered image. For instance, if you want to go all in with WebP today. Of course, Kaleidoscope also allows to render picture text with different sources. By default, each Kaleidoscope source will use the image source from the surrounding picture and apply source set, width, height, and format to that. This supports, supports the one cat image in different crops or one cat image in different formats use case. But <clears throat> different sources can also use different image sources, which allows rendering of total different cat images depending on the media query. So the black cat and white cat use case is covered as well. So far, we made creating of responsive images easy, but we also wanted a way to make spotting problems easier. To achieve that, we created a second image source, which we call dummy image source. This image source behaves the same as the previous one, but will create URLs for a local dummy image generator. The generated images show the rendered resolution as text, to allow to detect images with a higher or lower than needed resolution, together with some sharp corners and patterns to make it easy to spot the quality loss that occurs when browsers are scaling images. 
We use those images in the Monocle style guide and as placeholders in the NEOS backend, and it allows us to understand or debug the behavior of responsive images much better. Short animation that shows an image that is uh, displayed in different screen widths, and uh, the browser is picking a, a matching source for each resolution. Once more. So, without the uh, dimensions that are immediately visible in the dummy image, it would be really hard to spot and to understand which image was chosen by the browser. While I said earlier that CMS like NEOS are challenged for responsive images, NEOS also has some specific advantages which are playing in our favor. So to conclude the talk, here are some integration patterns that have been proven useful. Rendering in NEOS is controlled by Fusion, and Fusion itself is structured as a tree. This allows us to override Fusion prototypes for certain branches of that tree to adjust the behavior in a specific part of the website, like the header or a key visual section. The example shows a key visual being rendered while all kaleidoscope images and pictures inside of that, anywhere inside this branch, are configured for eager loading. Outside of the key visual section, the same components would still be loaded lazy because that is the default. A slightly more advanced variant of the same pattern enables eager loading for the first content of a page, which is a good idea in cases when you have no big key visual, but uh, the content is visible immediately above the fold while the user is uh, loading the page. To actually do this, you can add an iteration name to the content of the main content collection. And later use this main content iterator to configure the loading of images and pictures in the case of the first to eager and otherwise to lazy. The next, um, it is very nice when editors are able to use the same content they are already familiar with in different contexts like containers or grids. But this leads to requirements of different behavior or dimensions, which is really hard to implement in a single component. A pattern that helps a lot in this case is switching between different presentations after looking at the context the current node is rendered in. The example checks whether the current node is in the main content collection, in which case it will render the main image component. And if it is in the grid collection, the grid image is used. In both cases, the same image source is passed, so the intention of the editor is exactly the same. So the editor uses a familiar content element, but rendering may be different depending on the context. The last pattern I want to show you, since the whole topic is not totally trivial, it is sometimes necessary to verify the responsive behavior of a whole website, and this can be really tedious. Once more, Fusion prototype overloading can help. With the snippet above, if you place it in the root Fusion of your website, the example will override all image sources with dummy image sources, but preserve the dimensions that were selected by editors or integrators. The whole site is then rendered with dummy images, 
showing the exact the dimensions the browser selected and that were configured. That is especially useful when you are working with a style guide, which, or without a style guide, or with a style guide that has disintegrated a bit over time and you no longer trust it to be 100% accurate. But even with a well-maintained style guide, it still helps to get the whole picture at once. Of course, that is for development. You should not push this to your server. So, what to take home? Caring for responsive images often makes the difference between mediocre and actually good performance. Luckily, there is no rocket engineering involved, but the topic is also non-trivial and easy to mess up. Tooling can help to understand the behavior and make the generation of the needed URLs easier. Kaleidoscope is such a tool. You can use it if you like it. It is one of the packages that we at Sidegeist use in every project, so we will keep maintaining it anyway. That's all I prepared for today. Now it's time for your questions. Thank you, Martin. Not only for the cat content, uh, a great talk, uh, a small topic actually, images, that uh, fills not only a whole talk, but um, is very interesting. And also in regards to climate, uh, I just read that uh, one source said 1.76 grams per page view of a, an average page is mm -hmm. being produced. So you could reduce this one as well, course, just yeah. with doing some things right. Yeah, you don't, don't transfer bits that are not needed. Yeah, and don't That's, underestimate uh, this. But of course, uh, one thing is important, uh, maybe I missed that. Um, responsive images is not always about saving bits, because while you are saving bits for a mobile device, um, when you're on a large desktop, you are actually sending quite a lot of bits because you are sending a high-resolution image of maybe 2,000 pixels or 4,000 pixels, which actually takes a lot of bandwidth, but um, that also results in optimal quality. So users on large screens really need those big images. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we do have some questions, don't we? I had one. Oh, At least. Sure. Maybe you have some more. Oh, I have two. Good. Can Let's I? start with the first one. Oh, I no. actually see no clock. I have no idea how long it took me. You're pretty good in time. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Actually, that's not true. I have four questions. Does the format of generated image depends on the source image? Should it be the same format? Um, if you are not enforcing a format, it will use the, Im uh, the format of the source. So, okay. whenever possible. When using Kaleidoscope, is it possible to specify a variant preset that should be used so that different variants may be used depending on the size of the view viewport? That would have actually been the nice um, question. Yeah, you can. Um, image sources can... Uh, uh, there is a method on the image source you can say with variant preset mm -hmm. or uh, with uh, something preset and uh, then Either the image variant is used or the dimension from the, uh, which is configured for the thumbnail preset. So you could use a single image source, but in each picture source, um, you can use a si uh, separate variant from that. So what have you done? What, what's the behavior with SVG uploads? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Um, Actually, it's, it's a bit like with uh, Neos Media. When Neos Media is handling images, it always looks into the file and says, oh, that looks uh, like an SVG. I will not touch it. Um, Kaleidoscope does quite the same. So when an image source is used and it sees that this is an SVG image, it will 
default to another image source, which is, which is uh, a resource image source that simply renders a single URL. So you can use it, mm -hmm. and it will be rendered in the dimensions as expected, but um, there will actually be no source set rendered, but a single image tag, or maybe if you use different uh, sources inside a picture tag, then it would switch between different files, but there are no, no, not multiple resolutions of an SVG to be rendered, yeah. because sure. that's the whole point of SVG. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but totally, uh, one thing that could be improved here is um, the understanding of resolutions of the SVG. Um, currently, there is uh, no way or not an implemented way to determine the dimensions an SVG file has, which would be helpful to render width and height attribute to reserving screen space. Mm -hmm. So that is something I really would like to do one day, to actually look into the SVG file and say, yeah, hey, it's uh, 400 by 400 pixels. Uh, we should just render the dimensions <laughs> and avoid some layout shifting. <laughs> yeah. But um, that can be done, and one day, <laughs> <laughs> if you find the time, it, 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 it's yeah, if I find yeah. the time, or some customer finds, finds it uh, important enough to yeah. actually finance some hours for that. Great. It's so yeah. I've got two more questions. Two more you. questions. Why is the image loading attribute set to lazy by default, as opposed to HTML spec? Because saving bits by default is a good idea. Good answer. So, um, I, uh, eager loading is a default in HTML because it has been that way forever. So, uh, by, by using eager as default is, uh, for HTML is the backwards compatible way. But um, I personally am a bit more progressive than that. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, the last question, I think. What about adding an uh, additional option for a compressor to the package, like tiny PNG and so on? Um, can you repeat it? What about adding an additional option for a compressor to the package, like tiny PNG? Um, that is actually not a topic of Kaleidoscope. Um, Kaleidoscope uses the same cropping methods of NEOS itself. And um, what I think this refers to is the problem that images that are generated by PHP are, don't use the most efficient compression which is possible for JPEG or RAPP or PNG. And that in most cases it would make, it, it usually makes sense to have a second compressor which uh, optimizes the generated file. If you already use, um, a thing like mock image optim, which uh, applies um, an extra compression to generated images, it will work together with Kaleidoscope from the start. So that would be the level where one would integrate it. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind in that case is that not all of those packages that uh, optimize images after generation are compatible with cloud storage. Mm -hmm. because they are generating, uh, uh, optimizing an image on the local file system. But we created uh, a package which is called Sidekeist Iconoclasm, uh, <laughs> which is actually, um, which, which um, works in a way that it will um, be compatible with um, cloud storage like Amazon S3 and stuff like that. Other than that, it is quite similar to mock image optim, so it's, uh, yeah. it, it does only some things different, and I would consider this more an infrastructure topic, so that's why I left it out for this okay. talk. Perfect. So uh, thanks a lot, and I think Actually, we, we do have a question. Yes. We are a bit running out of time. Last one. <laughs> Last one. What's about different variant presets at different breakpoints? Um, you do not want to do this in a source set, you want to do this in a picture tag, because if you define a source set, you promise the browser those are the same images, just in different resolution. So using um, a different variant preset in this case would 
breaks the contract with the browser, so I have no clue what will happen. And most likely, the image will be scaled in an unfortunate way because the browser assumes the width and height attributes you specified in the beginning are still to be used. So you can do it in a picture tag with the same mechanism I um, mentioned before, yeah. so with variant preset. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So anyone who has found the emoji can ask him the question tonight, how he comes up with those fancy package names. <laughs> <laughs> and we also thank you, Martin, for being here, for um, being at this conference, holding this great talk. We have also a little present for you as a speaker, and um, we hope you can enjoy the rest of the conference now even more. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And the scary part is over. Very good. So. Enjoy the rest and please, for Martin. Thank you. Thank you.